Have you ever thought about it? I mean, really. What is the purpose to life? Why are we here? Where did we come from? For that matter, where are we going to go when this life is over? Hmm. In this seminar that talks about the age of the earth, Dr. Hoven gives solid evidence to show that this earth is not billions of years old. In fact, the evidence points towards a literal six-day creation, like told about in Genesis chapter 1. Hi, my name is Aaron, and we hope you enjoy this incredibly powerful seminar presented by Dr. Hoven. It's called The Age of the Earth. Well, thank you for joining us. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for the last 14 years, I've been an evangelist doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I don't like anybody sneaking up on me, so I'm going to tell you what I believe so you know what my seminar is going to be about here. I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover. I even believe the cover on mine. It says Kent Hovind. I believe that. And in case you don't know, the Bible is your basic instructions before leaving earth. You may want to read the book because you're going to be gone for a long time. Be sure you're going to the right spot. Now, one of my jobs as a Christian is to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in me. And I think in the last 200 years, <clears throat> the Christians have not done a very good job of answering the atheists and skeptics. And we've allowed this evolutionary philosophy to take over our school system, our, our legal system, our whole thinking process. And it's about time we do something about it. There are three things I try to accomplish in my seminar. Number one, I want to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Number two, if you're not saved, I'm going to try to get you converted today. Number three, if you're saved and you're not doing much for the Lord, then I'm going to try to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> Plain and simple, you know what I believe and where I'm coming from now, so that ought to make it easy. I won't sneak up on anybody. That's what I believe. Now, I need to warn you, just about every sin in the book is mentioned in my seminar series. It's likely that everybody's toes will be stepped on at least once. We recommend steel toe shoes or a willingness to move your feet. <laughs> you will need one or the other. All right, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. <laughs> be our 30th anniversary this summer. The first prayer I ever prayed in my life. I was about two minutes old. My mom said when I was delivered, they handed, her to, handed me to her and she counted my fingers, make sure I arrived intact, and then she folded my little hands and said, Lord, would you please supply my boy a good wife someday? And man, did he do it. Wow. Been 30 years this summer. It's been awesome. I really appreciate it. My wife, she's a piano player. And I used to play a piano in a marching band. I just hurt my back so bad, I had to give it up. Uh, but uh, I'm kidding. We have three children. Uh, we live in Pensacola, Florida. We have three kids, one of each. My kids are 24, 25, and 26, a year and two weeks apart. It's called family planning where I come from. Let's see. Son uh, Eric is an evangelist. He travels and speaks on creation. And his wife uh, works in our finance department, and they made me grandpa last uh, September 2002. And then my son Ken Andrew, sitting back there at one of the cameras, uh, he and his wife made me grandpa again about uh, four months ago. And he works in our video editing department, and she works in our bookstore. And then my other daughter, my only daughter, I found someone two years ago to take over payments on her. And uh, <laughs> she's my scheduling secretary, and her husband runs our shipping and receiving department. So we not only believe in nepotism, we practice it around our place. All six of them work in our ministry, and we're proud to have them. Now, we have in our ministry Dinosaur Adventure Land. If you ever get to Pensacola, you have to stop and see the most unusual place on planet Earth. I got sick and tired of all the museums and science centers teaching evolution. So I said, let's just do one that teaches creation. So we have a science center, hands-on activities, a museum, and an activity theme park that will blow your mind. Everything has science lessons and spiritual lessons. We had 10,000 visitors our second year open, shooting for a whole lot more this year. We have lots of kids come through. People come from all over the world just to see our dinosaur adventure land. We want to help start these all over the country. We think God ought to get the glory for His creation. Everything we do has a science lesson. Kids learn about science and they learn how to be closer to the Lord. That's the purpose of what we're doing here. Dinosaurs every place. Our ministry is sponsored by folks who love the Lord and love our ministry. When I started this ministry 14 years ago, I said, Lord, I'm not going to copyright my stuff. I'm not going to charge for seminars. And I'm not going to send out a letter every month begging for money. And if you don't supply, I'm going to quit, plain and simple. <laughs> and it's been really neat. The Lord just lays it on somebody's heart and something comes in the mail and the Lord has supplied. It's been 15 years that way now almost and it's awesome seeing the Lord supply. So come on down and pay us a visit. We have a lot of homeschool science classes that we offer. We teach homeschool classes there at our Dinosaur Adventureland facilities. And we have stuff on all kinds of different topics. We add more all the time. 
God's given us about 30 just amazingly talented people to work in our ministry, and we think you'd appreciate it. If you're driving through Pensacola, be sure to stop in. <clears throat> We've sent out about 100,000 tapes a year for the last couple of years, videotapes. None of my material is copyrighted. Feel free to copy it and spread it to others. Of course, we'd prefer you get it from us, and we can use the income for our ministry, but if you want to copy it, feel free to do so. It's just been amazing watching it grow for the last 14 years from nothing to what it is today. Now, let's get started. There are four great questions that every single religion in the world tries to answer. Every religion, including atheism, which is a religion, you see, you have to believe there is no God. There's no way to know that. But every religion tries to answer these four fundamental questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer these questions depends upon how you view the world. There are two ways to look at this world. Some people look at the world and say, you know, it's amazing. A big bang made this from nothing. That's called the humanist worldview. Other people look at the world and say, you know, there's incredible design. There must have been a designer. And that's called the creationist worldview. And those two worldviews are absolutely at war with each other. Somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are. <laughs> I do a lot of debates. The universities have had three debates in the last nine days. Been traveling all over the country doing debates, and I've had 77 altogether now. Can't wait for my next one, but we can't find any more opponents. They don't want to defend the idea that we all came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago, I guess, and we're running out of, running out of opponents. But the idea that uh, evolution is true, I think, is not only silly, I think it is dangerous. But if the evolution theory is true, how would you answer the four fundamental questions of life? Who am I? And what am I worth? Uh, well, if evolution is true, you are nothing important. You're just a piece of protoplasm that washed up on the beach. And you're not worth a thing. Actually, you're part of the problem because you're one of the polluters of the environment. And the more of you we can get rid of, the better. See, that's normal thinking if evolution is true. Where did I come from? Well, if evolution is true, <clears throat> we all came from a cosmic burp about 20 billion years ago. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Well, if evolution is true, there is no purpose, so you might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Where am I going when I die? Well, if evolution is true, <clears throat> we're all going to the grave and we're going to get recycled into a worm or a plant. But the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if that's true, that puts a very different set of answers to those questions. That means we better try to figure out who God is and find out what He wants and do what He says. But boy, the devil doesn't like that. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. Did you know the first sentence out of the devil's mouth was a question to make Eve doubt God's Word? He's still doing the same thing today. He wants you to doubt God's Word. The second thing he said to the woman, he said, Ye shall not surely die. Now he's calling God a liar. The third thing he said was, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. And right there is where the whole idea of evolution got started. It didn't start with Charlie Darwin. It started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He wants you to think, you can become a god. Yes, boys and girls, we started off like an amoeba, and we're evolving. We're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. People ask me all the time, they say, Brother Hoven, do you think there's intelligent life on other planets? I say, no. I taught high school 15 years. There's not much intelligent life on this planet. Satan's a liar. Boy, I'll tell you what, a lot of folks have swallowed that, though. The Mormon church teaches if you're a good Mormon, when you go to heaven, you get to be God. And if you're a good Mormon wife, when you go to heaven, you get to be eternally pregnant, producing spirit babies. My wife don't want to go. <laughs> he said, that's not heaven, honey. And by the way, there are some great books to reach Mormons. And if you want to reach Mormons, get any of these books here on the screen. I'd recommend that 100%. Uh, this good website to reach Mormons, uh, utlm.org, Utah Lighthouse Mission, if you want to get that awesome website on the ex teaching, reaching the Mormons. I was shocked to find out a couple years ago, some of the major Catholic theologians of the past have taught that man gets to become God. Now, the average Catholic doesn't believe that, and they don't, they don't even know some of their leaders have taught that. But that's official doctrine, that man can become God. The idea that man can become God came from the devil in the Garden of Eden. He's the one who wants to be God. Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. 
You see, the devil wants to be God, but the job is not available. So he's all upset about that, and he can't be God, so he's mad at God, but he can't do anything to God, so he's mad at us, because we are made in God's image. Did you ever wonder why the devil hates you so bad? It's because you remind him of God. So he lied to Eve and told her she could become like God. Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. He said they're more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. Now, if you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to do it like my two big brothers did with me. I have two older brothers. They've always been older than I am. But when I was about six years old, I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois, and I came running in for breakfast one morning, and I was the first one there for breakfast. And I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. Well, a few minutes later, my two big brothers came in. They said, hey, Kent, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. How many of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling you get when you finally pull one over on them? <laughs> Boy, that morning I had them. I had them and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg little brothers for anything. They either beat them up and take it away by brute force, <clears throat> or they lie to them and trick them out of it somehow. So my brother said, hey, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. I was only six years old. It's been proven in laboratory tests. The brain doesn't even start to grow until kids are 18 to 20. <laughs> how many parents can verify that one from raising kids? Yeah. I said, no, how are bananas made? And they said, we're down in South America. They have these spiders that live up in the trees. And when they die, all their legs fold up, and then mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs. And a banana is actually made from moldy spider legs. I said, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana because you know it's the last one. They said, no, brother, we're not lying. You cut that thing in half and look in the middle, you can still see the black spots where his legs were. <laughs> you know, I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. <laughs> they lied to me. Have you ever been lied to before? And you know, I would not have believed that lie if it hadn't been for those black spots. If you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to mix it in with some truth. That's a technique they've been using for years to sell all sorts of different products. They mix two things together that do not belong together. That's what they do to kill rats. They mix good food and rat poison together. Did you know rat poison is 99.995% good food? There's very little poison in rat poison. But the poison is what kills them, of course. They mix two things together that simply don't belong together. They do the same thing to sell cigarettes. They mix them in with cowboys. <laughs> Have you stopped and thought about that? What is the connection between smoking Marlboro and cowboys? Do all cowboys smoke Marlboro? No. Do you have to smoke Marlboro to be a cowboy? No. If you start smoking Marlboro, do you become a cowboy automatically? <laughs> no. You may smell like a horse, but you are not a cowboy. <laughs> Actually, it's been proven in laboratory tests that nobody in the world smokes. Nobody smokes, only the cigarette smokes. The person is the sucker, that's all. <laughs> I think they ought to have some truth in advertising. They should put their real name on those things. They should call them cancerettes, breath rotters, bypass, malignant, phlegm balls, and money suckers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> truth in advertising. You know, but they do the same thing to sell beer. They try to associate beer with sports. What does beer have to do with sports? They always get some big old football player standing there holding his can of Bud Dumber. Or Bud Stupid. <laughs> you know, they call it Bud Weiser, but it don't make him any wiser, that's for sure. He's got his Bud Dumber, Miller Low Life, or Dead Dog, whatever it is. He says, man, you drink this stuff and you'll be a football player. Yeah, right. The Bible says you drink that stuff and you will wreck your life. Who hath woe? They that tarry long at the wine. How many lives have been ruined from alcohol? How many innocent lives have been ruined because somebody else was drinking and ran into them or ran over them or something? The Bible says don't even look at it when it becomes fermented. Habakkuk said, Woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink. One kid said to me one day, he said, What's the matter, Mr. Hovind? Don't you like beer? I said, I don't know. I've never tasted it. I'm 50 years old, never had a drop in my life. Well, I've had NyQuil a couple times. <laughs> and he said, Well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? I said, Oh, son, that's a brilliant way to live. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever laid your head under a semi truck? <laughs> well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? You don't have to try everything to figure out if it's good or bad. There's other ways to learn, you know. 
But this mixing of the good and the bad together is exactly what's going on in our science textbooks. Now, folks, I like science. I taught it for 15 years. I even have a PhD in education. Stands for post hole digger. Got one. I'm not against science. But I, 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 like, I want two kids here that like science that would like to learn the scientific way to shoot a rubber band. Okay, right there, ma'am. Do you know how to do this already? No, come on up here. Come on up here. And one more. Let's get one boy up here. One boy that wants to learn the scientific way. You can do it. Come on. You want to learn this? You can be a movie star, too. People are going to see this all over the place. Now, what's your name? Lindsay. Lindsay, and this is? Aaron. Aaron. Let me get my rubber bands here. I just happen to have a few rubber bands. Okay. Lindsay, pick a rubber band out of there. Okay. And Aaron, right? I want you to see how far down the center aisle you can shoot that rubber band. Okay. Lindsay, go ahead. Right, yeah, right there. Oh, wow. About uh, eight rows back. Okay. Aaron? Ooh, about nine rows back. Now, I know the scientific way to shoot a rubber band. In just a moment, you're going to ask me a question, and the question has five words in it. I already know the question that you're going to ask me. Huh. Watch this. You ready? Back row of the church. And the question is? How did you do that? How did you do that? I told you. It had five words in it. <laughs> now, I am fully aware of the fact that some people should not learn how to do some things. He's one of them. <laughs> she says he's one of them. Okay. <laughs> now pay attention. There are two sides to the rubber band. Are you with me so far? Okay. One side represents your flesh, your body. The other side is your spirit. What most people do wrong, and what both of you did wrong with rubber band shooting, you put the same emphasis on the flesh and the spirit. If you stretch both sides the same, when it goes through the air, if you could watch it in slow motion, they are fighting with each other all the way. <laughs> So all the energy is being used up on internal turbulence. Not good. The secret to high-speed velocity through a fluid medium such as the atmosphere, which offers resistance, is to minimize, <laughs> minimize or eliminate the turbulence. All I did differently when you weren't watching is I put one side tighter than the other, like this. This is tight. Loose. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. okay. Now, what's going to happen, if you can release it quickly enough, it takes a little practice, but it'll spin through the air, taking away the turbulence, so the spirit actually leads the flesh. So when I'm standing up here speaking, realizing I can hit anybody in the room. <laughs> it's an awesome feeling. You can understand that, can't you? Yeah. Yes, you can. Hey, thank Let's give a big hand here. Have a seat. <laughs> Uh, that is one of about 50 different science lessons we teach kids at our Dinosaur Adventure Land, how to shoot the rubber band the scientific way. And some of you are not going to go very far in your life because you put too much emphasis on the flesh. Quit emphasizing the flesh so much and start emphasizing the spirit, and you'll be amazed what you can do for the Lord. <laughs> when we get done here today, we're going to make some paper airplanes that will go about 400 feet during the break time. You can get on our website and see how to make those under super uh, long-distance airplanes. They're pretty cool, too. We like science. I'm not against science, folks, but I'm telling you, there's some poison mixed in with our science books. And that's what I want to show you today. I'm not against the science. I'm against the poison part. Here's a first grade textbook. They tell the kids in first grade, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. Now, just hold on a minute. Is the Earth four and a half billion years old? No, as we'll see in a minute. But if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. First graders believe everything you tell them. They believe bananas are moldy spider legs. I did. And then tell them again in second grade, since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. Down here it says, life too has evolved on Earth. This word evolved is a very tricky word. I've had 77 debates now at universities. I've learned how to win the debate in the first five minutes. If somebody says, do you believe in evolution? I simply say, what do you mean? Because there are six different meanings to that word. You let them define exactly what they mean, and you probably believe in it. Because one of the six meanings is indeed scientific, and I do believe in it. Five of them are not scientific. They're silly. But they mix them all together like it's some kind of package deal, and you've got to buy them all at the same time. This is how they confuse the kids. It's so simple. Now watch this. The first meaning of the word evolution would have to be cosmic evolution. Somewhere, somehow, time, space, and matter have to come into existence. The Bible answers that in ten words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, that's time. Time has three dimensions, past, present, future. 
You know, you can't be any place and be outside of time. It permeates everything. In the beginning, God created the heaven. Heaven is three dimensions, length, width, height. And earth, matter has three dimensions, solid, liquid, gas. A trinity of trinities and only ten words. You know, you can't have any one of those without the other two. If you had matter but had no space, where would you put it? If you had matter and space but had no time, when would you put it? Those three come into existence simultaneously. The Big Bang Theory has to try to answer that. It's a dud. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you have to have what we call cosmic evolution. Secondly, there would have to be chemical evolution. If the Big Bang Theory is true, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and maybe some helium. Well, then how did we get all these other elements? People say, oh, it's done by fusion. Yeah, you can't get past iron with fusion. Better study that one out. Thirdly, we'd have to have what's called stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Did you know nobody's ever seen a star forming? We see stars blow up all the time. It's called a nova or a supernova if it's a big one, but nobody's ever seen one form. One atheist I debated said, oh, we see a star forming right now in Crab Nebula. I said, no, you don't. You see a spot getting brighter. You are assuming a star is forming. It could be the dust is clearing and there's a star behind it. Nobody's ever proven the formation of one star. And yet there's enough stars out there that we know about that everybody on planet Earth can personally own two trillion of them to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> Fourthly, there would have to be organic evolution. Somewhere, somehow, life has to get started from non-living material. The evolutionist is stuck with a very embarrassing position. He still believes in spontaneous generation, even though it was proven wrong 200 years ago. They're way behind the time in their science. Then we'd have to have what we call macroevolution. This is where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you get a dog every time. And it could be that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But they're the same kind of animal. And every five-year-old kid knows they are. Is anybody, anybody in here five years old? Who's five or six? You got a, Yes, sir. Way at the back. What's his name? Sal. Seth? Sal. How do you spell that? S-A-L. Sal. Okay, Sal, I want you to take a test here, buddy. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? Sal? The banana. The banana. Let's give him a hand. All right. <laughs> This kid's five years old. He can figure it out. We've got college professors that can't figure it out. They think everything's all the same kind. Yeah. The Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind, not after their species. Darwin's book was The Origin of Species. That's not even what the argument's about. What's the origin of kinds? That's where the argument ought to be. And a kind is those that can bring forth. That's how you determine what a kind is. A horse and a zebra can bring forth. A horse and a banana cannot. Lastly, we have what is called microevolution. I don't like that word. I think it confuses people, okay? But they call it microevolution. Okay, I think it ought to be called just a variation. Whatever you call it, it happens. Variations within the kind happen, folks. Some pretty bizarre variations. You know, big dogs and little dogs. No question. Variations happen. That one is scientific. It should not be called any kind of evolution, but they do it. So, okay, we'll call it. The first five are purely religious. That's not part of science. The teachers are taught in their teacher's manuals, be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Now, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class we should be teaching science. Things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Things like the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, how did the world get here? We're here, you know. So that leaves only two choices. Somebody made the world, or the world made itself. <laughs> There's no other choice. Well, there are a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. <laughs> okay, you can forget about those folks. We are here. So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, or the world made itself like the humanists believe. Well, if the world just made itself, how did it get here? Well, the devil thought about that for a long time. And finally, one day, he came up with the Big Bang Theory. How many of you have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory before? I was on the airplane years ago, flying from Dallas to San Francisco, the land of the fruits and the flakes. 
and I happened to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley. I don't know if you folks here in Wisconsin have ever heard of Berkeley or not, but uh, Berkeley is not a Bible college. <laughs> so here I was on the airplane sitting about that far away from this guy, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that. So <laughs> I talk about it with him. <laughs> he, said, he said he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? He said, it came from the Big Bang. I said, really? I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you've never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang. And I believe in the Big Bang. Uh, but my Big Bang is a whole lot different than yours. You tell me about your Big Bang and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. <laughs> and so the professor started off on one of those answers. It looked like it came straight from the textbook. He said, well, Mr. Hovind, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe. Ooh, now that's a lot of stuff. And by the way, did you know the word universe comes from two Latin words? Uni means single, and verse is a spoken sentence. You know, we have verse and prose. Did you know we live in a universe, a single spoken sentence? God said, let there be. Now that'll preach, brother. There's a sermon in there someplace, okay? And if you can't find it, you ain't got no preach in you at all, all right? <laughs> all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. What? Everything in the universe squished into a dot smaller than a period on a page? Wow, that's one crowded dot. And heavy, too. <laughs> Who held that thing up? By the way, this ain't the first time it happened, kids. This textbook says, Someday all of the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. <laughs> Did you know they cut down a tree to print that? <laughs> Where's Al Gore when you need him? Mm, that's what I want to know, yeah. Now, this textbook author was brilliant. I could not believe how smart this guy was. He said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. <clears throat> you have to be at least that smart to write a book. He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorized that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? Yes, boys and girls, you see, one day, nothing exploded. And here we are. <laughs> oh, that explains it. That sure does. We could spend hours talking about the Big Bang Theory. Get my college class, CSE 101, if you want to get into a whole lot more. We took our seminar and stretched it out to 60 hours and chased every rabbit and kicked every dog. And we it's a whole lot more stuff on the college class, CSE 101, 102, 103, and 104. Here's Discover Magazine from April 2002. They said, boys and girls, where did everything come from? Yes, right here it says, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero. Nada. As it became bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. <laughs> How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory explains everything. Wow, I got to meet this Alan Guth guy. <laughs> Alan Guth said in Scientific American, he said, boys and girls, the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. In the Greek, that's a dot. He said, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Wow. Yes, boys and girls, you see, we all came from a dot, and the dot came from nothing. They call that science and put it in a science book? I think I'd call that a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. I said, Professor, well, what happened to your dot? He said, well, Hovind, about 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the universe was in this one little bitty tiny dot, and it was spinning real fast. This is what the textbooks teach. It spun faster and faster, and one day, <coughs> it exploded. And the pieces flew off, and they became galaxies, and sun, moon, stars, and finally, people, and were nothing but stardust. I said, sir, may I ask you a few questions, please? He said, sure. What would you like to know? I said, well, you told me 20 billion years ago, all the dirt got together for this big squish, and the big spin, and the big bang. Where'd all this dirt come from? Who made matter? He said, we don't know about that. I said, okay, sir, and I hold it. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created the heaven and the earth, then you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I don't know. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and you don't know where the dirt came from. 
So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> Don't tell me my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, no, no. They're both religious. Both creation and evolution are religious, but the news media and the textbooks try to make it appear as if this is an argument between religion and science. I did a debate in El Paso, Texas, and they said, religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. This is called slanted journalism. It was two religions debating each other, not science and religion. Evolution is a religion, not a science. Both views, both creation and evolution, are inherently religious. The difference is, the evolution religion is tax-supported. And they couldn't survive without tax support. I've been saying for years, anybody that wants to believe in evolution should start a private school and teach those that want, who else wants to believe in evolution? It's got, it shouldn't be funded by public tax dollars. I mean, come on, it's a religion. Nothing but a religion. And by the way, these two timelines are the same information right here. I'll be referring to this throughout the seminar. The Bible teaches that about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood that destroyed everything. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. That's what starts our calendar. And here we are today, year 2003. On this chart, every inch is 150 years. If I was to make the 20 billion year chart at the same scale as this one, this chart should actually be 2,100 miles long to match this scale. That would be from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale for the other one, okay? <laughs> anyway, the professor said he did not know where the matter came from. I said, well, sir, could you tell me where the laws came from? You know, who made gravity? Who made the law of gravity? Centrifugal force, inertia, who's the law giver? He said, we don't know about that. I said, well, sir, can you tell me where the energy came from? You know, it takes energy to make something move. Who bought the gas to run this machine anyway? He said, we don't know about that either. I said, sir, may I ask you another question, please? He said, uh, sure. What else would you like to know? <laughs> else? What do you mean else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, sir, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round to your puke. You've been on them before. He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you ought to get one, man. You could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on a merry-go-round, are there any fourth graders in here this morning? Any f oh, man, all right. I like fourth graders. I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade. <laughs> that was before they diagnosed ADD. <clears throat> We're going to put some fourth graders on the merry-go-round and get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. <laughs> Never mind. I'll explain it later. We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go faster, faster. Can't you go any faster? You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase two where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. <laughs> You get up around 60 miles an hour, the kids enter phase three, where they start screaming again. But now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop, though. Keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, the kids enter phase four. That's where they begin to fly off the merry-go-round. <laughs> now, if you watch this carefully, if the kids fly off the merry-go-round, and the merry-go-round is going clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or telephone pole. <laughs> That's because of a law in physics known as the conservation of angular momentum. You see, if a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, which is what the Big Bang would have been, all the matter in one spot, no friction, the pieces that fly off are going to spin the same direction as the original object because the outside is moving faster than the inside. And we could talk all day about the Big Bang Theory and the conservation of all sorts of problems within our own solar system for the conservation of angular momentum. But the professor said, yes, I understand about the conservation of angular momentum. I said, well, good. Then would you answer me just one question? If the universe began as a swirling dot, shh, shouldn't everything be spinning the same way? He said, yes. I said, well, did you know that uh, two, maybe three of the planets are spinning backwards? Did you know that eight of the 91 known moons are spinning backwards? Sir, did you know some of the whole galaxies are spinning backwards? Why? He said, that's interesting. <laughs> I said, no, sir, that's more than interesting. That's kind of hard on your Big Bang Theory. He said, why do you think they're going backwards? Whew, I was hoping he was going to ask that. 
I said, sir, it's very simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God did it that way on purpose, just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. <laughs> and it is stupid, okay? We cover lots more on that in our college class, CSE 101. I do believe in the Big Bang, though, because the Bible teaches the Big Bang. It says, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. In the original Greek, that's a Big Bang. So there's going to be a Big Bang. It just didn't happen yet. So kids, if you go to school and some professor says, do you believe in the Big Bang? You should say, yes, I do, and you better get saved and get ready for it. The Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. <laughs> Big Bang Theory is a dud. They've known about it for a long time. We could talk for hours on the Big Bang Theory. It is simply ridiculous. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher. It's 900 pages, and it's five bucks. You can get it from our ministry and give those out to anybody you know that wants to learn a whole lot more about creation. The second law of thermodynamics is called, uh, tells us that everything tends toward disorder. Did you know everything is falling apart? If you leave something alone for a while, it's going to rot, rust, die, break down, or fall apart. Nothing gets better by itself. The Bible teaches that. The heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment. Nothing gets better by itself. Take a look at your hairdo when you wake up in the morning. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Everything tends toward chaos. Here is Sue at 20. Here is Sue at 900, or at 90. <laughs> and here is Sue at 3,000. Everything tends toward chaos, folks, and you will also be ready for that day. But the textbook says we're getting better. Yes, boys and girls, humans probably evolved from bacteria more than four billion years ago. Was your great, 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 great grandpa a bacteria? Now, the t t evolutionists will say, Now, Hovind, don't you know you can overcome the second law by adding energy? They say, The earth is an open system. It receives energy from the sun. Oh, and that's supposed to fix the problem, huh? Well, you got several real serious problems there, sir. First of all, the universe is a closed system by definition, not receiving any more energy. Secondly, adding energy is destructive unless there's something there to utilize the energy, an intelligent force. The Japanese added a whole bunch of energy to Pearl Harbor one day, didn't they? They didn't organize a thing for us, did they? We returned the favor and added some energy to a few of their cities a couple years later, didn't we? <laughs> didn't, didn't organize a thing. We've been adding energy to cities all over the world ever since, folks. It hadn't, 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 hadn't organized a thing. See, adding energy is destructive unless there's something to use the energy. The sun adds energy to your roof all day long, and it'll destroy the roof on your house, not build it. The sun will actually destroy your entire house if you don't keep fixing things. The sun will destroy the roof on your car, not build it. It'll destroy the paint job, not build it. There's only actually one thing that can use the sun's energy, and that is chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is a highly designed, complex molecule that uses the sun's energy. So when these evolutionists say, the sun adds energy and that somehow overcomes the second law, they're either dreaming or they're lying to you. It does not overcome the second law of thermodynamics. This textbook shows the kids a fossil starfish. And it says, boys and girls, 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. Was your great, 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 great grandpa a starfish? I bet he could pick oranges like crazy. All right, now please do not laugh at this next picture. This will be a picture of my brother when he first wakes up in the morning after his first cup of coffee, which apparently was a little too strong. Uh, by the way, kids, we have to warn this next generation. Listen carefully. Kids, do not drink coffee. Because if you drink coffee when you're young, when you get married, your babies will be born naked and illiterate. <laughs> don't drink that stuff. Okay. This will be my brother on the left. Now, here he is right there. Please don't laugh. Right there. Notice what the textbook says. Boys and girls, 30 million years ago. Kids, let me translate that for you. Anytime a textbook says millions of years ago, what it really means is long ago and far away. It means a fairy tale is coming next. That's your warning, fairy tale coming up. It says 30 million years ago, these critters evolved. Oh, there's that word again. You got to watch that one. Remember, it's got six different meanings. Be careful about that word. It says they're ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans? Grandpa? What big eyes you have, Grandpa. <laughs> ah, the better to see you with, my boy. 
You know, we've been teaching kids are nothing but an animal, and today a lot of them act like animals. A lot of folks can't figure it out. Barbara Reynolds figured it out. She's a journalist. She said, your kids go ape in school? Here's why. He's being taught evolution. Guess what, Johnny? You're an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Uh, you mean I'm just an animal? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't even know what kind that one is. That's a porcupine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, let me ask you a question. If evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? How do you tell right from wrong? If we were going to make a list of things to discuss, abortion, premarital sex, extramarital sex, theft, uh, murder, pick, a, pick any topic, any moral issue, and before you decide what's right and wrong, you have to decide how you decide. Do you decide right and wrong based upon majority opinion? Do you decide right and wrong based upon what Congress thinks is right or wrong? Is there an absolute standard someplace? How do we tell right from wrong? Or does that change every generation with every new leader we get? Where's the standard? Have you noticed the rock music these days is so full of death and blood and destruction? Well, the Bible says all they that hate me love death. How do you tell right from wrong? If evolution is true, there is no way to tell. One professor I debated said, there are no absolutes. I said, really? Are you absolutely sure? <laughs> ah, well, wait a minute. How can I be absolutely sure there's no absolutes? Yes, there are absolutes, folks. Thus saith the Lord. That's absolute. And the Lord said, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh, nor print any marks upon you. Some people apparently don't know or they don't care what God's Word says. How'd you like to marry that? Whatever it is. Now, well, the problem in America today, and in the world today is we've lost our standard. We have no way of determining right from wrong. Get a bunch of carpenters together to build a building, but nobody can have the same ruler. Everybody gets a ruler that has a different standard. <coughs> to one guy, this is an inch. The next guy, this is an inch. How's your building going to come out? Good luck. You have to have standards. We have a National Bureau of Standards to protect the standard meter, you know, the standard kilogram, the standard pound. You have to have standards. The problem is, in our morals in America, we no longer have any standards. We've thrown out the Bible and said, oh, well, if it feels good, do it. Well, look what you're going to get in your schools. We could spend hours talking about the loss of standards. We get into more of that on uh, videotape number five uh, about the uh, effects of this evolution teaching. Teachers don't seem to understand it's perfectly fine for you to teach creation science in public schools. There's never been a law against teaching creation in public schools. Two states, Arkansas and Louisiana, passed laws requiring that creation be taught. Now, that's different. They required the teachers to teach creation, and the court struck both of those laws down. And then the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, said, see, you can't teach creation. That's not what the court said. The court said you cannot require that creation be taught. Even Stephen Gould said, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before, and it can be taught now. That's what he said after the 1987, when the Supreme Court struck down the Louisiana law, the Balanced Treatment Act. Now, if a teacher does get up in their class and they teach evolution, if they tell you, okay, kids, you started off like a slime and you slowly evolved to a human, you don't need to be a genius to figure out that teaching is going to destroy some kid's faith in the Bible. And anybody that spends their time destroying a child's faith better read what Jesus said. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Anybody that teaches evolution is in serious trouble when they stand before God. I don't want to be close to you on judgment day. You are in big time trouble. The Bible says, Be not many masters, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation. James 3. Back in the 50s, the average textbook in America had very little evolution in it. It really wasn't talked about much. And then in 1957, the Russians beat us in the space race. They launched Sputnik, and Americans panicked. How many of you remember the panic in America when they were beating us in the space race? People were building bomb shelters. I mean, the whole thing. It was really serious, wasn't it? And somebody said, you know, the reason the Russians are ahead in science is because they teach evolution in their schools. What does evolution have to do with putting up a satellite? 
Now, the reason they were catching up or beating us in science is because we had spies over here sending them all our information. I spoke in Russia. Trust me, you don't want what they've got. They've got a slogan over there. They say, what one American builds, ten Russians cannot understand. What one Russian builds, ten Americans cannot lift. <laughs> Build it all out of concrete and steel, you know. In 1959 was the 100-year anniversary of Darwin's book coming out. And so somebody said, wow, we have to get more evolution in the textbooks. So they lobbied Congress, and as far as I can figure out, the first time the government got involved in producing textbooks was in 1959, in the early 60s. It's interesting, the number of words teaching about evolution jumped from two to 3,000 to 33,000 just in a few years. Evolution became the state religion. By 1963, prayer was taken out of our schools. Anybody remember that? Madeline Murray O'Hare? By the way, since 1963, the number of words about evolution has diminished because the number of words in the textbook has diminished. The overall teaching has been dumbed down. The percentage has remained consistently high. 1963 is when sexually transmitted diseases began to skyrocket for 10 to 14 year olds. Since 1963, the number of uh, kids with premarital sex have increased erratically since 1963. Unwed birth rates have gone up tremendously since 1963. Pregnancies have gone up over 500%. This is for 10 to 14 year olds. The difference between those two numbers are those being aborted. We get into more on that on video number four. Now, one third of all the kids born at the hospital are born to a couple that is not married. Illegitimate children. And if you are one of those, you listen carefully. God loves you and he can use you in a powerful way. He said he'd be the father to the fatherless. If your parents messed up, you just shut your mouth and go serve God with your life, okay? Paul used Timothy in a great way. He was an illegitimate child, never should have been born. Unmarried couples living together has increased 725%. God's word hasn't changed. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. He said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's one of the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. And by the way, Jesus said, if you even look in lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. By the way, ladies, I know you won't understand this, but that's why it's important how you dress. My daddy always said, if you're not in business, don't advertise. You figure it out, okay? Divorce rates have gone crazy in this country. Violent crimes have increased nearly 1,000%. I'm not that old, but I remember the days when you did not have to lock your house. Anybody else remember those days? And you left the keys in the ignition all the time. You never took them out because you might lose them. And you go to the average high school and half the pickup trucks in the parking lot had a loaded rifle hanging in the back window. And the truck wasn't even locked and nobody got shot in school in those days, did they? You probably didn't hear about this, but the kids at Columbine High School that did all the shooting were very strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Hitler's birthday on purpose to commemorate Adolf Hitler. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. Hitler hated black people. More on that on video number five. And right after the shooting, Rosie O'Donnell got on her program and said, See, we need more gun control. Uh, Rosie, those kids broke 18 gun laws going into that school. Do you think two more gun laws would have stopped them? See, Rosie can't seem to figure it out. Can't seem to be able to figure it out. But one guy figured it out and put it on the tire cover on his van. And I saw that and I got a picture. I said, man, this explains the whole thing. He said, blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie being fat. Uh, it's not the spoon's fault, Rosie, okay? And it wasn't the gun's fault either. Okay, we get a lot more on gun control in video five. Very politically incorrect. You don't want to watch that one. Uh, SAT scores have plummeted since 1963. Actually, in 95, they had to dumb down the test. They made the test easier to make the kids look smarter. Teen suicide rates gone crazy in this country. Now listen, if I told you, if you kiss a frog, it'll turn to a prince. You say, no, frogs don't turn to princes. How many of you ladies got your husband by kissing a frog? Come on now, be honest. <laughs> Looks like only two, okay, good. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but in the textbooks it does. Yes, boys and girls, we started like an amoeba, and we slowly evolved to a frog. There's Grandpa. And then very slowly became 
a prince. <laughs> you know, they're still teaching the same fairy tale. The only difference is, if the frog turns into the prince, quick, prince quickly, we call it a fairy tale. But if the frog turns into the prince slowly, we call it modern science. The only difference is time. See, boys and girls, the kiss won't do it now. Today you have to have billions and billions of years. How many have ever heard that expression before? Billions of years ago. Yeah, it's in the magazines and National Pornographic. A geographic, I mean. Billions and billions of years ago. They teach you like it's some kind of fact of science, you know. Here's a fourth grade textbook. Millions of years ago. Now, kids, listen. If anybody ever says, millions of years ago, just say, uh, excuse me, were you there? They'll say, no, of course I wasn't there. And then say, now, teacher, do you know the earth is millions of years old? Or is this what you believe? Is this really part of science? You see, science is things we can observe and study and test. Sometimes people say to me, well, Hovind, were you there when God made the world? I say, no. And I admit mine's a religion. Now, why don't you admit yours is a religion? Hmm. And once we've both admitted we have a religion, then answer my question, why do I have to pay for your religion to be taught in our school system? Hmm. That'll shut them up. Science is things we can observe and study and test. And the professors I debate will say, well, no, we can't observe the earth is millions of years old, but everybody believes it is. <laughs> no, they don't. Most Americans think the earth is less than 10,000 years old and God made it. Only 4% are atheistic. I think that 4% ought to go start themselves a private school and teach evolution to anybody that wants to pay and come learn it. And they ought to get it out of our public school system. That's my humble, totally unbiased opinion. <laughs> That's right. Now, it is true that slightly more than half of the scientists in America believe in evolution. Not all of them, but slightly more than half. Those are the ones that have not been to my seminar yet. <laughs> but even if a bunch of scientists believe something, that doesn't make it true. And that's not how you determine truth. You know, majority opinion. The scientists used to teach all the planets go around the Earth. They used to teach big rocks fall faster than little rocks. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's not true. They used to teach, if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood, you'll get better. That's how George Washington died. There were places all over America to get your blood taken out if you were sick. You could tell where they were because they had a white pole with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. Still is today, once in a while. <laughs> and right beside George was a Bible that told him the life of the flesh is in the blood. Man, if they'd have read that verse, he might still be alive today. Uh, well, he would live longer anyway. So, listen, if you went scuba diving and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the simple question, when did the boat sink? You say, I don't know. Uh, well, look at the dates on the coins. If there's a coin in there from 1750, you ought to be able to figure out that boat sank after 1750. How many can figure this out with no help at all? It couldn't sink before that, right? You find the youngest coin in the box, and that becomes your limiting factor. Now, how old is the earth? Well, there are some factors that limit the age of the earth, just like the coins would limit the age the boat sank. There are all kinds of things that limit the age of the earth. We're going to cover those in the next session. Different ways to show the earth cannot be billions of years old. But if you found a fossil like a dinosaur bone, I've got a copy of one here on the table. The real one's in our museum. We have quite an interesting museum there in Pensacola. If you find the dinosaur bone, you should notice two things about it immediately. Number one, it does not talk. <laughs> Number two, it does not have a date stamped on it. It does not say, made by a dinosaur in 70 million B.C. in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> they don't say that. So how would you tell the age of a fossil? How would you tell the age of the earth? Well, the only way to tell the age of something for sure is to find the guy who made it. He knows for sure how old it is. And the Bible says, God created the heaven and the earth. And the Bible says, Jesus created heaven and earth. Well, guess what? That's one of many verses that proves Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. The Bible does teach the Trinity doctrine. Okay? All three are called God. And Jesus said in Matthew 19, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Same thing in Mark 10, 6. Well, if that was the beginning, then we can figure out the age of the earth. Because you can go through the Bible and add up the dates. The Bible says death came because of sin. 
That's why we have death in the world. By man came death, the Bible says. And Adam all died. Adam brought death into this world. And Adam was the first man. And Adam lived and with Eve. Eve was his wife. And Eve was the mother of all living. Hmm. And Adam was 130 years old when his son was born. And that boy was 105 when his son was born. And that boy was 90 when his son was born. If you go through the Bible and add up the dates, you can make a graph like this one here. We've got these charts laminated if you want them for placemats when your skeptic friends come for lunch. <laughs> you can stir up an interesting conversation. Or if you get our seminar notebook, the last page will fold out to be one of those charts right there. If you want to study some interesting stuff about the age of the earth. If you add up the dates in the Bible, it comes to about 4,000 B.C. Not millions of years ago, roughly 4,000 B.C. Now, I'm not one of those guys that tries to put an exact date on it. I don't say that the creation... It was 4004 B.C., October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon. Okay. I don't think you can get that close from Scripture. I think Adam was made in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. It's the only clue I found. <laughs> and I can't prove this, but I think I figured out why God made Adam first. I think God made Adam first because he didn't want any advice on how to do it. <laughs> how many agree with that one? <laughs> Amen. I, I can see it now. No, God, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> now, B.C. means before Christ. Almost all new textbooks have changed it. They're not calling it B.C.E., before the common era. That's another long story, how Christ is gone from our schools. Of course, they blame God when something goes wrong, but, you know, they don't, they don't realize he's been kicked out. Um, here the textbooks now says the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Was he lying? Did he not understand science? Or was he right? How old is the earth anyway? And who cares? What difference does it make? Oh, it makes a big difference. And we'll cover all that in the next session. How to prove this earth cannot be billions of years old. But then if it is only 6,000, what about dinosaurs? What about the Garden of Eden? Why did they live to be 900 years old? What about Grand Canyon? How did the light from the stars get here? Where did all the languages come from? Where did all the races come from? That's why my seminar is so long, folks. We cover all that stuff. <laughs> I'm talking as fast as I can go, but we cover all that. Just hang in there. We'll get to more of that in the next session. Thank you so much. Welcome to our second session on our seminar part one about the Big Bang, the Big Dud, and the age of the earth. And for those just joining us, I do believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. And I believe it teaches exactly what the truth is about the age of the earth. Here's my family, minus the grandkids that have been coming pretty regular here lately. And we're excited about all that. The Bible says, in the beginning. When was the beginning? First three words in the book, it must be kind of important. When was the beginning? And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. Hebrews chapter 1. When was the beginning? How old is the earth? I believe this is a critically important topic. There are some Christians who say it's not important. Oh, I think it's very important, as we'll see in a few minutes here. Jesus said, all things were created by him. Colossians 1. By him were all things created. Jesus made everything, so he, brought, he probably knows how old it is. And he said, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Same thing in Mark 10, 6. That was the beginning. The Bible says death came by sin. The question is very simple. Did man bring death into the world, like the Bible says? Or did death bring man into the world, like evolution says? Total opposite, folks. Somebody's wrong. The Bible says man brought death into the world, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Some people say, well, what, didn't, didn't, animal, didn't plants die before Adam sinned? Well, you better decide if plants are alive first. We covered that on video number seven. Are plants really alive in the biblical sense? The Bible says Adam was the first man. It's real clear on this topic. It says Adam lived 130 years and had a son. His boy lived 90 years and had a son. That boy lived or 105. And then that boy lived 90 years and had a son. If you go through the dates in the Bible and add them up, you're going to get about 6,000 years ago. Roughly 4,000 B.C. Now, not millions, that's for sure. So the Bible teaches about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood. The time before the flood was very different. We'll cover more on that on video two, what the Garden of Eden was like and why they lived to be 900 years old. But the fact is, the Bible dates add up to about 6,000. 
Now, I do a lot of debates at universities and radio and TV call and talk shows, and atheists always say, well, Hoven, uh, who did Adam's sons marry? Well, that's a good question. Who did they marry anyway? The Bible says Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare a son. Well, who's his wife? Well, it doesn't say he found her there. Well, who did Seth marry anyway? Well, that's a good question, and I think a very honest, fair question. But the evolutionists are the ones that have the serious problem. See, they believe 20 billion years ago, nothing exploded and made everything in the Big Bang. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, and it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive three billion years ago. That's what the evolution theory teaches. Yes, boys and girls, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. Hmm. So they teach 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive around three billion years ago. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. That's what their theory teaches. We could spend a couple hours on this one. Who did Adam's sons marry anyway? Well, the Bible says Adam lived after he begat Seth 800 years and begat sons and daughters. How many kids could you have in 800 years? Several, right? A friend of mine from Arkansas, running for Arkansas State Senate, great godly man. He needs to get in, by the way. If you're in Arkansas, vote for him. Named Jim Duger, Jim Bob Duger. Has 13 kids in 13 years. How many could he have in 800 years? <laughs> Several, yeah. <laughs> Keep it up, Jim. Keep, get, bring them kids on. He's raising good, godly kids. That's the way to do it. Well, the Bible says, Adam lived 800 years after Seth was born and had sons and daughters. So in the first generation, they married sisters. People say, married sisters? Well, now calm down. First place, there is no other choice. <laughs> Secondly, who would you report them to? Thirdly, there were no laws against it till Moses gave the law 2,500 years later when Moses gave the law way up here. They didn't need any laws against it for the first couple thousand years because there weren't any deformed chromosomes. You wouldn't have any deformed children. You see, everything about you is inherited. Even having children is hereditary. If your parents don't have any, you won't either. <laughs> say, wow, I never thought of that, Brother Hovind. <laughs> well, think about it. You'll see I'm right. People say, what, you can't marry sisters. What about genetic similarity? Adam married his rib. You talk about genetic similarity. <laughs> it's not a problem in the first generation. And it's amazing. These atheists will say, well, you got inbreeding then. Well, talk about, you, what, look what you guys believe. You believe we all came from a rock. You talk about inbreeding. <laughs> What's the gene pool of a rock, huh? Explain that to me. But anyway, you won't notice this reading your Bible, but when you graph it out and get one of these charts, you notice Adam lived long enough to know his great, 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 great grandson. I mean, Noah, Noah's daddy could have known Adam. Can you imagine a family reunion back in those days? <laughs> okay, everybody hop on the camel. We're going to go visit great, 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 great grandpa Adam. And he's going to tell us what it was like in the Garden of Eden before the first woman ate the first man out of house and home. Now, I do tell a lot of Adam and Eve jokes, okay, because I ha happen to like Adam and Eve jokes. I happen to like jokes in general, but one lady said, just where would you men be without us women? I said, in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be lonely. It wouldn't be worth it, okay? I'll take it like it is. Anyway. <laughs> now, you also won't notice this reading your Bible. When you look at the chart, you notice Noah's son, Shem, lived after the flood long enough to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I read a verse in the Bible once that really had me confused for a long time. I read a lot of verses that get me confused. And I said, read this one. I said, wait a minute. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said, I'm 130. And then he said, few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, but they've not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers. Strange verse. Well, when you consider Jacob could have personally known Shem, Arphax, and Selah, and Eber, you know, if you're 130, but you know a 600-year-old living down the street, you just don't feel too old, you know? <laughs> People say, the Bible's handed down generation after generation. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, first of all. God inspired it, and he preserved it. Secondly, it's only, it's all, the book of Genesis is written by 10 different eyewitnesses. There are 10 different authors to Genesis. We cover all that on seminar part 7 of question and answer, who wrote Genesis? 
But here the textbook says the earth is billions of years old. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Well, was he lying, or did he not understand modern science, or was he right? How old is the earth? Textbooks in your town teach the kids, billions of years ago this happened, right? Or millions of years ago. They just throw these numbers out like there's some kind of fact. Billions of years ago. Even some Christians are going around claiming the earth is billions of years old. I debated Hugh Ross for three hours on the John Ankerberg show. You can get that videotape series, a whole series of tapes from me against Hugh Ross. He says the earth is billions of years old. I say, no, it's not. Quite interesting conversation there. Who cares about the age of the earth? Well, I think this teaching of billions of years is going to put death before sin. And now you have a heresy. We cover lots more on that on the college class, CSE 101, or on our seminar part two. The uh, Bible says death came because of man. Man brought death into the world. Well, who cares about the age of the earth? Well, number one, I think the credibility of Genesis is at stake. The question is very simple. Can the average person read that book and understand or do we have to have some guru what it means? If you're in a situation where you have to have somebody tell you what that book means, you're probably in a cult. I get real nervous when somebody gets up in front of their crowd and says, well, it says in the original. In other words, you've got to have me to tell you what this really says because you you're not capable of finding it on your own. That makes me just nervous, I'll tell you right now, okay? I think the average person can read the book and understand it. We don't need anybody to tell us what it says. Secondly, the credibility of Jesus is at stake. Since he quoted that book 25 times, he must have believed in Genesis. Thirdly, nearly every other book in the Bible refers to Genesis. This is a very important topic. Now, the guys who believe in evolution really care. Because if you take away billions of years, their theory looks real silly. Jesus said, had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. He wrote of me. Let's look at some scientific ways to show the earth cannot be billions of years old. In 1999, this article came out in the newspaper announcing that the world's population had crossed over the six billion mark. If you don't know how much a billion is, don't worry about it because Congress has no idea either. <laughs> but in 1985, there were five billion people on planet Earth. In 1800, there was only one billion people here. Almost all textbooks agree and almost all people who study this agree. There were around a billion people around 1800. It's just simple scientific fact. And everybody agrees the population is growing rapidly. Nobody argues with that. But the world is not overcrowded. Don't fall for that overcrowded propaganda going around the schools. The world's not overcrowded. The whole world's population today would fit inside Jacksonville, Florida twice. That one city has 25 billion square feet. The world's not overcrowded. Have you driven across Nebraska? or Kansas, or Wyoming, or Montana, or drive across Wisconsin. Folks, the world's not overcrowded. You've got to fly out west like I do all the time. And it's not, look out the window, it's not overcrowded. Hey, if it's overcrowded where you are, move. <laughs> Places are not overcrowded, okay? Figure it out. <laughs> not overcrowded, come on. But back when Jesus was here, there was about one quarter billion people on planet Earth. 250 million. It sure looks like from the population growth curve that the whole population today started about 4,400 years ago. Well, that's interesting. The Bible teaches God made everything about 6,000 years ago. 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood. Eight people survived, Noah's family. If you start with a population of eight people, having kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, you can get yourself a population of five or six billion in a few thousand years. Now, if you believe in evolution, you've got a problem. Because you think man's been here for three million years. Wow. In three million years, the population would have grown. <laughs> right now, there would be 150,000 people per square inch. That would be crowded. No, man's not been here for no three million years. God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Have lots of kids. Fill it up. Have a big family. But Satan wants to destroy God's plan. God formed the world to be inhabited, he told us in Isaiah 45. That's why he did it, inhabited. But we got folks like Jacques Cousteau who said we need to reduce the population of the earth. He said we need to eliminate 350,000 people a day to save Mother Earth. Ted Turner said we need a 95% decline in population levels. Okay, Ted, you first. There are some folks who would like to reduce the population to a half billion as soon as possible. 
They've got their grandiose plans toward a new world order with them in charge and all of us gone or slaves. But the idea is to have a half a billion people. See, the Lord told the devil in the Garden of Eden, you're going to crawl on your belly and eat dust all your life. And then he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Satan knows some seed of the woman's going to bruise his head. And so he's been trying desperately through all of humanity, history, trying to destroy every human being on the planet. He absolutely hates people. Remember when Herod wanted to kill baby Jesus in Bethlehem? What did he do? Slew all the children. Let's just be sure to get the right one. And Satan seems to want to kill all of humanity. And he's putting this idea into the heads of some of his followers that they need to reduce the population of the planet. We could talk for hours about that and get my CSE College Class 101 if you want a whole lot more on the New World Order plans on reducing the population. Coming soon. Well, regardless of what happens to the population in the future, the fact is the chart today shows man's only been here about 3,000 or 6,000 years or less. 4,400 would fit fine with the population growth. If you go outside the city of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, to the town of Elberton and go north about seven or eight miles, you'll see the Georgia Guidestones out in the middle of no place. They mine quite a bit of granite there. The Cherokees called this area the center of the earth. They thought that was the center of the earth right there. Well, a bunch of guys who don't know much said, wow, let's set up big rocks here. And they put these big rocks up there with 12 different languages on them that says the Ten Commandments for the New World Order. Commandment number one for the New World Order is maintain humanity under one half billion. They think we need to reduce the population of the planet as soon as possible. It's interesting, they ran an article here recently. They said sometime in the past, man's population of man went through a bottleneck. They said it dropped down to only a few thousand people about 70,000 years ago. Well, I think they're getting close to the truth. I think it dropped down to eight people about 4,400 years ago. Yeah. The galaxies up there are spinning, but the stars on the outside are going faster than the stars on the inside. The gra galaxies gradually lose their spiral shape. So the question is, if they're billions of years old, why are they still spiral shaped? Why are there spiral galaxies? Well, to the Christian creationist, this is no problem. They're not billions of years old. Real simple. Stars are blowing up once in a while. We call it a nova or a supernova. And yet there's only about, it happens, seems to happen about every 30 years, kind of as a rough average. When they look through the heavens, though, they find less than 300 supernova rings. That's only a few thousand years worth. Why aren't there millions of them? Hmm. Some evolutionists say, well, new stars are forming to replace the ones that are blowing up. Well, that's baloney. Nobody's ever seen a star forming. We cover lots more on that on video number seven. The teachers are taught to tell their kids that red stars slowly evolve into white dwarf stars, and it takes billions and billions of years for this to happen. That's what the textbooks teach. Well, it does seem to be true that red stars apparently change to white stars, but it doesn't take billions of years for this to happen. All the ancient astronomers described Sirius as a red star. Everybody said it was red. Study back in history. Sirius was a red star. Today, Sirius is a white dwarf star. We know what happens in less than 2,000 years, yet the textbook says it takes billions of years. Some of the planets are cooling off. You can't just keep cooling off. Pretty soon you're cooled off. I mean, if you came in the room and found a cup of coffee on the table and I said, don't touch the coffee, it's hot. And you said, whose is it? I said, I don't know. It's been sitting there for 400 years. <laughs> it's kind of hard to believe, don't you think? It's still hot after 400 years. These planets cannot be billions of years old. Jupiter has a moon called Ganymede, but it still has a strong magnetic field indicating a hot inner, inner core. Even the atheists will admit it should have cooled off billions of years ago. Well, it's not billions of years old. Figure it out. Saturn has rings around it, but the rings are slowly moving away from the planet. Saturn's rings are indication that it is not billions of years old. The moon is going around the earth. How many knew that already? The moon goes around the earth? Okay. Did you know as the moon goes around, it's gradually getting further away? We're slowly losing the moon. It's only a few inches a year. No big deal. Nothing to worry about. Plus, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Uh, but the moon is getting farther from the earth every year. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The moon is getting farther from the earth every year. So that means that it used to be closer. How many can figure this out with no help at all? Okay. Well, if you bring the moon in closer, you start to create a problem because the moon causes the tides. 
Now, you folks up here in Wisconsin probably don't worry about the tides. But in Pensacola, where I live, you worry about the tides. <laughs> if you brought the moon in closer, the tides would be higher. There's a law called the inverse square law. If you brought the moon into one-third the distance, you take the one-third, inverse it, and square it, it's nine times the gravitational pull. If you run all the math on this, you'll find out about 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the earth. That explains what happened to at least the tall dinosaurs. <laughs> they got mooned. You can't say it's 4.6 billion years old. I'm sorry, that's just geophysically impossible. Comets are flying around through space, but they're always losing material. That's what makes the tail on a comet, you know, the stuff is blowing off. They only last about 10,000 years. Because you can't just keep losing and losing, you know, pretty soon it's gone. It's kind of like your checkbook. See, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall every time. Well, comets are losing material. They last about 10,000 years and poof, they're gone. I mentioned in a seminar one time that uh, comets indicate the solar system is less than 10,000 years old. And this one atheist went home and did, devoted an entire website to me, an anti-Hovind website. There are now over 400 anti-Hovind websites. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> hey, the Bible says we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Salt irritates. If you're not irritating somebody, you're not doing it right, folks, okay? I offer to debate all those guys any day with half my brain tied behind my back, just to make it fair. They don't want to do that, though. They all want to get me into an email debate. I say, fellas, I type 12 words a minute with 19 mistakes. I get 1,000 email a week. I'm not about to get into an email debate with anybody. Okay, I can barely got enough time to sleep <laughs> and, and eat. It's a busy life around my place. But if you want to debate me publicly, anytime, anywhere, all of you together, if you've got an anti hoven website, put up or shut up, you just pick your spot, I'll take them all on, in Christian love, of course. Um, <laughs> but this guy on his website said, Hoven, don't you know the reason we have new comets, we have comets still, is because new ones are coming in from the Oort cloud. That's their answer to why we still have comets. He said, in the 1950s, a Dutch astronomer named Jan Oort proposed, that means he hoped, he wished, he prayed, that there was a great shell of comets out there putting new ones in all the time. He said, this Oort cloud is 50,000 astronomical units away. Well, in case you don't know, an astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the earth. That is called one astronomical unit. It's real hard to see Pluto without an incredibly good telescope, and Pluto is 39.44 astronomical units away. You certainly cannot see a comet that is 50,000 astronomical units away. See, actually, nobody's ever seen the Oort cloud. Oort never saw the Oort cloud. The whole thing is based on a mathematical mistake. There is no Oort cloud. But this scoffer said, if you want to use the comet argument, it's up to you to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the Oort cloud and other sources don't exist. Oh, <laughs> now slow down a minute, Dave. How do you prove the non-existence of anything? What he's trying to do here is called shifting the burden of proof. The liberals are really good at doing this on us, folks. It's so easy to shift the burden of proof. I'll show you how easy it is. Watch this. Suppose I said, Watermelons are blue on the inside until you cut the skin. Prove I'm wrong. <laughs> if all I have to do is make up a story and you've got to prove it's wrong, I can keep you busy the rest of your life, can't I? And if all they've got to do is make up a story about an Oort cloud and I've got to prove it doesn't exist, I mean, come on, that's not how science works. You've got to prove it does exist. What we know is we do have comets. We know they don't last long. We know the Bible says 6,000 years. I don't have a problem with the comets. But he's trying to make it look like I've got a problem with the comets. No, no, Dave, you got the problem with the comets. I don't have a problem at all. They fit fine with my theory. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Evolution theory has the sun and stars coming before the earth. The Bible has the earth coming before the sun and stars. Did you know absolutely everything about the evolution theory is backwards? I have Christians all the time say, don't you think God could have used evolution? I said, well, first, that's not what the Bible says. Second, you've got a retarded God who can't do it right first time. He's got to practice. <laughs> Thirdly, your God's cruel and ruthless. He uses suffering, misfits, and death. You've got a different God than I do. I'm sorry. Okay, no. God did not use evolution to get us here. We cover a whole lot more on that on video number seven about the theistic evolution uh, disposition. Uh, everything's backwards. You know, the Bible has the earth before the sun. Evolution has sun before the earth. The Bible has oceans before land. The earth evolution has land before oceans. We can go on all day about the differences between these two theories. They are not compatible. Don't pretend that they are. They're not. They're incompatible. They're opposites. 
The psalmist said, when I consider thy heavens. Hey, kids, he says, when, not if. You do yourself a favor to shut off that TV once in a while and go out and consider the heavens. Parents, if your kid likes laying in the yard looking at the clouds or looking at the stars, just leave him alone. Unless he's got some homework to do. Maybe that's the reason, you know. <laughs> but it's good to take time to consider what God has made. The psalmist said, while I was musing, the fire burned. The word muse means to think. Think. English is a very cool language. Did you know a theist is a person who believes in God? If you put the letter A in front of that word, it means the opposite of. So an atheist is a person who does not believe in God. Muse means to think. <clears throat> ah, muse means to not think. That's what the word literally means, to not think. They've got entire parks around this country where you can pay money and go do that. <laughs> Have you ever heard of them before? They're called ah, amusement parks. <laughs> a place to not think. Yes. He said, when I consider thy heavens the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, a person that spends his time considering what God has done is not impressed with what man can do. And some of you parents ought to go home and look in your kid's bedroom, and if what you see plastered all over the wall are pictures of sports heroes, think about it carefully. Your kids are being trained to meditate on what man can do. Whoa, he threw the ball through the hoop. Oh, did you see that? Oh, <laughs> who's going to care in a thousand years? Who's going to care in 20 years? And does anybody know who won the stupid bowl, a Super Bowl 10 years ago? Does anybody care? It doesn't matter. All those grown men out there fighting over that one ball, they can all afford to go buy their own. <laughs> we get all excited over dumb stuff. <laughs> who's going to care in a thousand years? It's been estimated there's enough stars that everybody on earth can own two trillion of them to yourself. Go spend some time looking at them. We could talk a long time about the stars. We'll cover more on that on video number seven about the stars. How do we see the light, you know, billions of light years away? Yeah, we got a long answer on that in video seven. The Bible says, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. Did you know the earth is like a big magnet? Now magnets always lose their strength. The earth's magnet has lost 6% of its strength in the last 150 years. The magnet is getting weaker which means it used to be stronger, which means the earth can't be more than 25,000 years old because the heat generated from the stronger magnetic field would have destroyed life on earth. That also means carbon dating doesn't work. We'll cover lots more on carbon dating in question and answer time video seven. Here's an example though. The lower leg of a mammoth carbon dated 15,000 years old. The skin was 21,000 years old. Talk about a slow birth. One part of a mammoth was 29,000 years old, another part's 44,000. It just doesn't work, folks. We cover lots more on that on video seven. The textbooks will say, well, yes, the magnetic field's getting weaker because it's part of a pattern of reversals. The magnetic field is reversing. This is pure baloney. The magnetic field of the Earth is not reversing. There are stronger and weaker magnetism areas, but not reversed. Follow video six for that, but that's all part of a theory called Pangea. How many have ever heard of Pangea? They'll say, Yes, boys and girls, millions of years ago, all the continents used to fit together. Oh, really? They don't tell the kids they shrank Africa nearly 40% to make them fit. They also don't tell them they took out all of Mexico and Central America. Hey, senor, que pasa? Donde esta Mexico? Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala. Mm. <laughs> they also don't tell them what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. If you take the water out of the oceans, you will notice there is dirt underneath. People say, hey, Hovind, do you think the continents were ever connected? I say, what are you talking about? They still are. <laughs> what do you mean, were they? Hello, it's not hollow under the oceans, you know. They're still connected. Yeah, it's just the low places are full of water. That's all. <laughs> uh, what a dumb theory. We cover more on that on video six. I think the continents are moving some, no question. Okay, I like Walt Brown's hydroplate theory myself. I think that explains the whole thing. We cover that more on video six. Okay, the earth is spinning about 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, but the earth is slowing down. The earth slows down enough that every once in a while they have to add a tick to the clock to put the clocks back on schedule. New Year's Eve, 1990, they said we have to add a tick to the clock because the clocks are off by a second because the earth is slowing down. They said the earth slows down a thousandth of a second every day. 1992, I did, they did it again. Astronomy Magazine said earth's rotation is slowing down. June is going to be one second longer than normal. We're going to have a leap second. Now most people have heard of leap year. But many people have never even heard of leap second. 
even though we have one every year to year and a half. We have to have a leap second because the earth is slowing down and you're putting the clocks back on schedule. Now kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The earth is spinning, but it is slowing down. How many can figure this out? Okay. Which means it used to be going faster. How many can figure that out? Okay. Now, if you go back 6,000 years, this is not a problem. The earth was spinning a little faster when Adam was here. He wouldn't notice. He didn't have a watch anyway, as far as we know. But some of these guys would like me to believe everything is billions of years old. Ooh, now you go back a few billion years, the earth was spinning real fast. Your days and nights would be pretty quick. Get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed, get up, go to bed. You'd never get nothing done. Centrifugal force would have been enormous. The winds would have been 5,000 miles an hour from the Coriolis effect. And you think the dinosaurs lived 200 million years ago? Ooh, man, I know what happened to them. <laughs> they got blown off. No, they did not live 200 million years ago. Uh, Sahara Desert has what's called a prevailing wind pattern. The wind almost always blows the same direction. This creates a problem. The hot air coming off the desert kills the trees next door, and that area becomes desert. And once that soil gets sterilized, it's real hard to bring it back. The process is called a desertification. They did quite a study on Sahara because they know it's growing about four miles a year today. After studying Sahara for a long time, they said, we think that desert's about 4,000 years old. That's pretty old. Uh, but I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger desert someplace? Why is the biggest desert in the world less than 4,000 years old? Hmm. Well, I have a theory about that desert. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. And it's pretty hard to have a desert under a flood. So the desert couldn't start growing until the flood water went down. Psalm 104, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, the water rushed off. And so I predict, based on the Bible, the biggest desert in the world will be less than 4,400 years old. <laughs> it is. <laughs> wow. Maybe the Bible's right. Did you know when they drill into the ground, sometimes they hit oil? The oil often is under incredible pressure, up to 20,000 pounds per square inch. It'll come squirting up out of the ground, poof, like a big zip, 20,000 PSI. The guys who study the rocks on top of the oil say the pressure of the oil is greater than the weight of overbearing rock, which really creates a problem. It should have cracked the rock in less than 10,000 years. Okay, well then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why is the oil pressure down there still? And where'd the oil come from anyway? Well, nearly all scientists agree that oil comes from organisms that are squished. They're changed by heat and pressure into oil. Years ago, they learned how to make a barrel of oil in 20 minutes in the laboratory from a ton of garbage. They learned that 30 years ago. In Australia, they're taking sewage sludge and changing it to oil in 30 minutes. Sinclair has the dinosaur as their logo. They say the dinosaurs turn to oil. Yes, boys and girls, it mellowed for 80 million years. I don't think so. I have a theory about the oil. Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Now, in that flood, lots of critters and people drowned. They got buried by the gravel and the rocks and the mud and the sand. It got pretty heavy on top, and it squished them <coughs> into oil. So the oil's down there from the people and animals that drowned in the flood. Which means, if you stop and think about that, you drove over here today on some of your ancestors. Next time you're at the gas station pumping them in there, you can say, bye, Grandpa. <laughs> you should have listened to Noah. He told you it was going to rain. Mm -hmm. It did, too, didn't it? Uh, I was preaching in Denver one time, and some guys came to the meeting, and they said, now, Hovind, uh, we know you teach the earth is millions or is 6,000 years old. We'd like to prove to you you're wrong. Come with us, please. They took me to the Denver National Ice Core Laboratory. They've got this freezer, huge freezer, about the size of this auditorium. We walked in there, 36 below zero. I got Florida blood, folks. That was cold. I know for you that's summertime, 36 below. <laughs> for you Wisconsinites. But, uh, we walked in there, and they said, Mr. Hovind, we go to the South Pole and to Greenland, and we drill holes through the ice. And we save the middle part of the hole. Has to be a government job, you know. And <laughs> saving ice holes, yeah. We can drill these holes down in the ground, and we save the core, the core sample in this freezer. We would like you to see these core samples. I said, oh, that'd be very interesting. 
I walked in the freezer. They showed me these core samples. And they said, Hovind, you see these rings on here? I said, yep, I see them. You can see them very clearly. They said, what happens in the summer, the snow melts a little bit, and then it refreezes and makes clear ice. But in the winter, the snow packs, and it traps the air bubbles, and it makes white ice. So these rings, clear, you know, it shows up dark here, you know, dark light, dark light, represent summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. They said, now the deepest hole we ever drilled is 10,000 feet. And you can count the rings, 135,000 of the annual rings. Now why do you go around teaching people the earth is only 6,000 years old? I said, fellas, aren't you assuming those are annual rings? So they didn't know about the lost squadron apparently, but some airplanes ran out of gas during World War II, it hit a storm, head turned back, they crash landed in Greenland. A rich guy from Kentucky got a brilliant idea to go get those airplanes off the ice. How many have ever heard of the Lost Squadron before? In 1990, they went looking for those airplanes. They found them using ground penetrating radar because they were 263 feet below the surface since World War II. They found them using a radar machine and they located a P-38 and they melted a hole down to get to it. As they melted the hole down, got down deeper and deeper and deeper. Finally, they hit the airplane, melted a big hole, and took the airplane apart and brought the pieces up through the hole, took them all back to Middleborough, Kentucky, and put it together. It finally flew in the fall of 2002, I believe, was the first time it flew again. The P-38 from World War II. I talked to the guy who dug out the airplane. His name is Bob Carden. I said, now, Bob, that airplane was in the ground for 48 years. It was 263 feet down. That's five and a half feet a year. The deepest hole the guy's ever drilled looking for ice cores is... Uh, 10,000 feet, you divide that by five and a half, you get 1,800 years. Hmm, what happened to the 135,000? Now I know deeper layers get squished. They turn to glacial fern, okay? So really 44, like the Bible says, 4,400 years, that's plenty of time to account for the ice. So I went and met Bob, talked to him. There's his phone number if you don't believe me. I said, Bob, you dug the airplane out, is that right? He said, yes, sir, there was a crew of us, but I was on that crew. I said, Bob, when you melted down to get to the airplane, did you melt through ice rings? He said, oh yeah, there were many hundreds of them. I said, wait a minute. How do you get hundreds of annual rings in 48 years? Looks to me like there should be 48 of them. He said, oh no, there were hundreds. See, those aren't annual rings, folks. Those rings represent, they don't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one day around here, can't you? <laughs> yeah. But here's a guy from Scientific American. Still calling them annual rings. Now either he's ignorant or he's a liar. I hope he's just ignorant because ignorance can be fixed. Stupid is forever. By the way, that's the difference. Uh, here's a guy from Alaska who wrote me a letter. said, Brother Hovind, I work with the Eskimos up here. He said, I got 15 layers of snow on my car in eight hours. Not 15 inches, 15 distinct layers of snow. Eskimos have over 40 words for snow. What else is there to talk about? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the kids are taught in school that each of the layers of the earth is a different age. This is pure baloney. Those layers all formed in the flood in the days of Noah. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting those layers. There's a bunch of pictures on our website, drdino.com. Go there and check out the article about petrified polystrata fossils. It does not take long for things to petrify. Things can petrify quickly. Uh, Mount St. Helens blew trees into Spirit Lake. Many are already beginning to petrify in 20 years. Here's a piece of petrified firewood. Here's a petrified dog found inside a tree when they cut it down for firewood in Georgia. They said, wait a minute, don't cut that tree up. There's a dog inside. Petrified, turned to stone. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. Doesn't take millions of years to give birth. Petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. Articles on the table down here called the Limestone Cowboy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We'll cover lots more on rapid petrification on video number six. Uh, the Mississippi River, I did a debate the other night in, in Mississippi, so they call it Mississippi. The Mississippi River is depositing sediments at the rate of 80,000 tons every hour. 80,000 tons of mud per hour go down the Mississippi and dump off in New Orleans. That delta is growing larger and larger and larger. Well, They've studied the delta pretty carefully. They say it probably took about 30,000 years to put all that mud out there. Okay, well then I have a question. If the earth is millions of years old, why isn't the whole Gulf of Mexico full of mud by now? Hmm? 
they're going to say, hey, it's 30,000. The Bible says 6,000. That proves the Bible's wrong. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, no, it doesn't. Mm. I got a theory about that, Delta. Here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the flood water was running off, whoosh, about half of that mud washed out in 20 minutes. So it looks like it took 30,000 years. They forgot the flood. A friend of mine from Louisiana said, Brother Hovind, I was working in the oil field before I pastored a church. And he said, I used to go out in the Gulf of Mexico and drill holes looking for oil. He said, we drilled through 14,000 feet of mud and hit trees 60 feet tall. The flood runoff formed most of the erosion out in the Gulf of Mexico. Here's a picture of the oldest tree in the world. The oldest tree in the world is a bristlecone pine. It's 4,300 years old, according to this textbook. Earth's oldest organism. Now, some people say, oh, no, we counted one and it's 4,600 years old. Well, trees do not always produce one ring a year. It's very common for them to produce two rings a year. Okay, so tree ring dating is not an exact science. We cover that later on in seminar on the college class 101. Go into much more detail on that. But uh, 4,300 years old, oldest living tree. That's interesting. If the earth is millions of years old, why don't we have an older tree someplace? Why is the oldest tree 4,300 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. Here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Destroyed everything. So the oldest tree ought to be around 4,400 years old. Unless, of course, one floated for a few years in the for a few months in the flood and rerouted. That's possible, I suppose. So I don't have a problem with the oldest tree, folks, if it's a Bible theory perfectly. This is a picture of a coral reef. You know, the largest reef in the world is in Australia. It's called the Great Barrier Reef. I had a call from a church in Brisbane. They said, would you like to come preach over here? I said, I need to pray about this. He said, yes. I got to go take my family to Australia. I got to go scuba diving with my daughter at the Great Barrier Reef. It was incredible. During World War II, some of the reef was destroyed by ships and anchors and bombs and stuff like that. So the environmentalist wackos went out there to see how fast it grows back. They watched it grow for 20 years. It was a government project. <laughs> Based on a 20-year study of the Great Barrier Reef, they said it's less than 4,200 years old. That's interesting. But I have a question. If the Earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger reef someplace? Why is the biggest reef less than 4,200 years old? Well, I have a theory about that. <laughs> I bet you know what it is, don't you? You can figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Here's a picture of Niagara Falls. I was just up there last week, actually, at Niagara Falls. The textbook says, boys and girls, the rocky ledge above Niagara Falls has been eroding for 9,900 years. How do they know that? Well, the water goes over the edge, and it breaks off the rocks, and the waterfall is moving backwards. All waterfalls do this, okay? It's eroding backwards. Actually, the museum guide tells us it's eroding backwards 4.7 feet a year. It was until they diverted most of the water for hydroelectric power. Now they can actually shut off the falls if they want, <laughs> change the water to a new channel. But up until about the 1930s, 4.7 feet a year. Hmm. Charles Lyell went there in 1841 and said, boy, the Niagara Falls is way back there. It obviously used to be up here. Niagara Falls is moving back down that gully. Pretty obvious to anybody. That gully's uh, four or, uh, seven miles long. Now Lyell said it's 10,000 years to erode all that. Later, he changed it to 35,000 years. The people who lived there said, Charlie, uh, it erodes a whole lot faster than that. Now, Charles Lyell's the guy that wrote this book right here, Principles of Geology. Charles Lyell did not like the Bible at all. He was looking for some way to discredit the Bible. This is the book that destroyed Darwin's faith, by the way. We get into a whole lot more of that on video number four about Charles Lyell's book. But he, he made up these numbers purposely to try to discredit the Bible. He knew, though, that Niagara Falls put a time limit. There was a limit to how long it could have been eroding. It runs over the falls into the gully, seven miles long. This textbook says it took seven, seven and a half miles. It took uh, 9,900 years to make that. Oh, I don't think it's quite that simple. See, Niagara Falls is right there. It used to be further north. It's eroding south. Well, if the earth is millions of years old, why hasn't it eroded back to Lake Erie by now? Why is Niagara Falls right there? Well, I have a theory about that. 
Now, here's my theory. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the flood water was running off, whoosh, about half of that gully washed out in 20 minutes because you had lots more water and soft rock. Hadn't hardened yet, remember, from the flood? It erodes much quicker when it's soft. So it might look like it took 9,900 years. No, they forgot the flood. They also forgot to get their numbers right. It should have been 8,400 had they used the right divider, but oh well, public school textbook, what do you expect? Um, you know, when it rains, 30% of the water runs into the ocean, bringing with it mineral salts. The oceans are getting saltier every day. Today, they're 3.6% salt. They could have done that in a few thousand years. So the question would be, if the oceans are millions of years old, why aren't they saltier like the Great Salt Lake, the Dead Sea, Salton Sea? Hmm. Why only 3.6%? One atheist I debated one time said, Hoven, if you believe that flood, would you please tell me how the, uh, how the freshwater fish survived the flood? I said, well, sir, aren't you assuming the flood was salt water? He said, the ocean is salt water. I said, well, yeah, it is today. But I suspect during the flood, it was mostly fresh water. It might have been, you know, tangled up mess a little bit with the flood going on, but I think mostly fresh water. And I think the oceans have gradually become saltier, and some animals have actually adapted to salt water. And today we have freshwater crocodiles and saltwater crocodiles. And they probably had a common ancestor, a crocodile. <laughs> he said, see, that's evolution. I said, oh, it is not. Going from a freshwater croc to a saltwater croc is a minor change compared to what you believe. So you believe they changed from a rock to a croc. <laughs> that would be a major change. Mm -hmm. How many of you have ever gone into a cave and the guide said, don't touch the formations, they take millions of years to form? <laughs> sure, they all, they got the same speech at every cave, don't they? Go to Carlsbad. Took 250 million years with tiny drops of water. They say it takes a thousand years to grow one inch. I don't think so. Here are some 50 inch stalactites growing under the Lincoln Memorial, built in 1922. There's a bat covered up with flowstone, didn't even have time to rot, he was preserved by stalagmites, which grow even slower. There's two inch stalactites growing off a refrigeration shed in Pensacola, Florida. There's a building in Indiana, it was only open for 40 years, and the basement was getting full of flowstone formations in 40 years. This picture shows the inside of a cave that was shut down for 55 years in Australia. It's now full of stalagmites, stalactites, ribbons, columns in 55 years. There's two people inside that circle for scale. There's a 13 inch stalactite growing off a pipe dripping water in a building built seven years before this picture was taken in Herbert Field near Pensacola, Florida. On the bottom was a stalagmite. They broke it off and gave it to me. Seven years. It's in my museum. In uh, Texas, they built a place for cars to park for the uh, University of Texas in Austin. They had to put a pan up to catch the drips because there's stalagmites growing on people's cars, parking underneath them. A guy in Wyoming had a hot spring in his property. He stuck a pipe in it about 100 years ago. The water came out the pipe and ran down the sides. They called it the teepee fountain. And everybody thought, wow, that's cool. He's got a fountain in his yard. Well, as, it went down, as the water ran down the side, some of it evaporated, leaving behind mineral deposits. How many have seen those mineral deposits in your sink before? Okay, the guy died, and they left the pipe sticking in the yard. Here it is, 100 years later. That would take some lime away, wouldn't it? <laughs> Don't tell me it takes millions of years for these formations to form. It does not. You're confused or you're lying to somebody because it doesn't. The guy down the road put a pipe in his yard later. It's not quite as big, but still, it's pretty impressive. At the current rate of erosion, the continents are going to erode flat, be gone in 14 million years. We have landslides, mudslides, ground creep, mass wasting, exfoliation, avalanches. Does the ground ever fall up? It's always down, isn't it? Well, then why do they tell us we've got fossils that are 300 times older than that still above sea level? Some, one atheist said, Hovind, don't you know the crust of the earth is sometimes rising, sometimes sinking? You know, you get volcanoes, military rock. Well, no. Well, that's where fossils are found, folks, sedimentary rock. Think about it. 
You can drive out west or fly out west and just look out the window of your airplane once in a while. There are erosion patterns all over this planet that are incredibly huge in places where it hardly ever rains. Grand Canyon had to be formed in a matter of a few weeks. We cover that on video four. It did not form slowly by the Colorado River. There are ripple marks that are a mile apart, huge ripple marks in southern Iraq. Evidence of a massive amount of water moving rapidly. A flood is the best explanation for this. Zargos Mountains. The oldest languages in the world are about 6,000 years old, less than 6,000 years old. But that fits what the Bible says. The Chinese calendar says this is the year 4703. Of course, they might have started with Noah. As far as Noah was concerned, the flood was a one-year cruise. It didn't start his life, you know. Or Shem lived 100 years before the flood. Might have started with Shem. I don't know what they started with, but they think Fuhai is the father of their civilization. Hebrew calendar said this is the year uh, 5763. Question, why are there no historical reliable records back more than five or 6,000 years old? I wouldn't trust the Egyptian calendar. They stretch all sorts of things in the Egyptian calendar. We cover that in video seven, I believe. Um, folks, the evidence for an, a young earth is overwhelming, but the students are never shown this. They're only shown the earth is billions of years old because they have to have billions of years to fit their theory. And I think there's a long interesting reason why they're only shown one view. They're afraid the kids might come up with a philosophy like our founding fathers had. You know, belief in creation. And if some folks start believing in creation like our founding fathers, they don't make good slaves. The Declaration of Independence said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. If you get a bunch of guys together who believe they have rights that come from the creator, those guys don't make good slaves. They're going to throw the tea in the harbor and start a big war. Right? And there are some folks who would like everybody to believe in evolution because that's part of a major part of the plan toward a new world order. You have to keep the people, you know, like cows, you have to keep them kind of submissive. Cover more on that on video number five. But 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools are losing their faith in the Bible, largely because of this evolution teaching. That's exactly what happened to Crawford Toy. Most folks have never even heard of Crawford Toy. They know about the girl he almost married. Her name was Lottie Moon. She became a great missionary to China. The Southern Baptists today still have the Lottie Moon offerings every Christmas. Crawford Toy went to Europe and studied evolution. He began to believe it. He came back and told his seminary class. He was a seminary professor. He said, folks, the Bible intends to teach a plain six-day creation. The Bible is simply an error at that point. Now listen, you seminary professors, if you're, not, if you're gonna teach your kids the Bible's not true, why don't you quit that job and go get an honest job picking peaches or changing tires and quit destroying the faith of kids coming through your class. Yeah. Crawford thought the Bible must have an error in it. Well, Crawford, maybe your theory has an error in it, huh? Maybe you got brainwashed. Hey, folks, it's very easy to get brainwashed. I'm going to try to brainwash the whole crowd, and then we're going to quit and take a break. Maybe you've never been brainwashed before. It's a harmless procedure. I will tell you a little story. As I tell the story, I will brainwash you, or try to. If you know the answer to the questions, it's probably because you saw my seminar before. <laughs> if you don't know the answer, it's because you have been successfully brainwashed. Now, here goes. Now pay attention. Here's the story. Very simple. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men we're waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men? And why did he leave home jogging? If you know for sure, raise your hand. There's a few of you, okay. The rest of you, pay attention. Let's try it again. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. I'll give you a hint, that's important. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men were waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? Did anybody new figure it out? One more. 
Okay, the rest of you, pay attention. We're going to try this one more time. But now I'm going to unbrainwash you. See, you didn't realize it, but you got brainwashed in about the first five seconds. And right now you're brainwashed, but you're going to feel yourself get unbrainwashed as I tell the story again, because this time, while I tell the story, I will show you a picture. This picture will unbrainwash you. It's a cool feeling. You can feel it coming. Wow, I get it. Here goes. Now pay attention. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways, turned left, and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed there were two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men? Ah, uh, the catcher and the umpire. You say, Brother Hovind, is it that easy to get brainwashed? Yep. <laughs> as soon as I said a man left home, you started thinking about a house. And for the rest of the story, you couldn't figure out who those guys were. You see, if you get somebody off track in the first few seconds, you got them. Would you like to see how thousands of kids get brainwashed in your county every year? Thousands of them. Here's how it works. It's so simple. The kids go to kindergarten and they get a book like this. I can read about dinosaurs. Would anybody like to just take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? <laughs> Millions of years ago. How did you know? You think there's any books like this in your public library? Mm -hmm. How about your public school library? How about on TV, Nature Channel, Discover Channel? Oh, yeah. Even Dr. Seuss says millions of years before you were born. Millions of years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth. Hey, that's calling Jesus a liar. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. The Bible says there was no death till Adam sinned. We've got a serious difference here, folks, in belief systems. Some people say, now hold on a minute. If the Bible's right, the Bible says they lived to be 900 years old. I mean, how's that possible? Oh, we cover that on video number two, the Garden of Eden. We'll cover that next. Why they lived to be 900. And what about the dinosaurs? Where do they fit in? Uh, well, we cover that on video number three. Dinosaurs fit in just fine with the Bible view. They've always lived with man. But listen, kids, carefully. If some teacher gets up and says, okay, kid, you started like a slime and you slowly became a human, that's a philosophy that's going to destroy your faith. Don't believe that for a second. The Bible says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man and the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Hey, question, question. If a kid goes 12 or 16 years to school in your town, how will he view the world? Probably like it came here from evolution. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created. Now, if the Bible's right about the beginning, maybe it's right about the end. Maybe it's right when it says, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you're going to hell. He that hath not the Son hath not life. The wrath of God abides upon him. Let's uh, summarize here and we'll quit. Number one, God made this world. Number two, he owns it. Number three, he makes the rules whether you like it or not. <laughs> it belongs to him. Number four, we are all guilty of breaking his rules. Paul said, I had not known sin, but by the law. God gave us the law to show us we're sinners. Here are the Ten Commandments. He said pretty clearly in commandment number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Put your hand up. Come on, put your hand up or you're doing another one. Robin, get your hand up there. You, okay, don't, give me that. <laughs> don't give me that pious look, all right? Number eight. Thou shalt not steal. How many ever stole something? Come on, you already told me you're a liar. Put your hand up, okay? <laughs> okay, let's get it straight now. So far we know we're all a bunch of lying thieves, right? <laughs> you want to read the whole list and see how we're doing? <laughs> it's not too good, okay? So we're all guilty of breaking his laws, which means we're going to have to be punished, or you better find a substitute. And if you think your good works are going to take care of your bad ones, you are really deceived. What if you went to the judge and said, Your Honor, I only killed one person. Look at all the people I didn't kill. <laughs> my good works outweigh my bad. <laughs> you think he's dumb enough to fall for that? God's not going to punish you for your good works. Only for the bad ones. 
and the wages of one sin is death, so you're in trouble. Real serious trouble. That's why we better find a substitute. So February 9th, 1969, I said, Lord, I am a sinner. I deserve to go to hell, and I, I know you died in my place, and I'd like you to forgive me and save me right now. I prayed and asked the Lord to save me, and he made me one of his kids. And now if I do something wrong, it's a different matter. See, I, God was, was going to be my judge, but now he's my father. It's very different. If my kid commits a crime, breaks the window on the house, I'm not going to call the cops. It's a family matter. We're going to settle this in the family. Now, if the neighbor kid breaks the window, I might have to call the cops. You know, you might have to involve the law because he's not my child. But once you become God's child, it, it's treated very differently when you sin. It's a family matter, not a judicial matter. How about you? Are you in the family? These deer figured out if they stand in the water, the forest fire goes right past them. Pretty cool. Hey, did you know if you are in Christ, God's judgment will go right around you? I'm not going to be judged. Not for my sins anyway. Praise God. <laughs> I'd be in trouble if I was. How about you? What if these guys do reduce the population of the earth here pretty soon? What if we're all dead tomorrow? I don't know when we're going to die. I'm going to die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen to you too. If you died today, where would you go? You really should think about it because you're going to be dead for a long time. George Washington died over 200 years ago. He is still dead. How much longer does he have to go? Dead for a long time. Hey, all you get is a little dash between two dates, folks. You could die today. Have you seen the way they drive here in Wisconsin? <laughs> Bunch of rednecks, I'm telling you what. You get killed this afternoon. <laughs> Where are you going when you die? Man, think about it. That's extremely serious. You got that little bitty dash between two dates on a rock. That's all we're going to end up with. I'd recommend you give that whole dash to Jesus. Say, Lord, I ain't got much, but you can have what I got. He'll take it and make something out of it. It's amazing. Wayne Strickland picked out his tombstone already. Wayne Strickland, atheist. Wow. Interesting. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But you know God doesn't believe in atheists. Great book by Ray Comfort we sell. He's a good friend of mine. <laughs> He's hilarious. God doesn't believe in atheists. Don't tell me you're an atheist. You're not. Nobody's an atheist. I don't believe you. Prove there's no God, huh? <laughs> God's not willing that any should perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance. If you're here today and you're a Christian, last question. What on earth are you doing, for heaven's sake? Everybody ought to find something to do for the Lord. Do something. There's a war going on. If you're not going to shoot, carry bullets, but do something. Feel free to use our material if that'll help. Get one of our catalogs and you can get our materials. They're not copyrighted. Spread them around. Our seminars on VHS or DVD. We're putting everything on DVD as quick as we can here. We've got a lot of debates I've done with atheists at universities and stuff, a lot of other topical series that might help you. Folks, the goal is to reach people with the gospel. So we have a series of homeschool tapes, Dr. Kaboom, Dr. Kabang, as well as homeschools, all kinds of material. Just get our catalog and look through there. We have college classes for those that want to go down deep, stay down long, come up dry. A whole lot of material on there if you want to get into our CSE 101, 102, 103, and 104 classes. Our goal is to strengthen your faith. So God made the world in six days, 6,000 years ago. Why did they live to be 900? Uh, we'll cover that in the next session. Why they live to be 900 years old. Coming up next. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? 
would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. Forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help.